Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cyclic AMP signaling. Okay, right. So we're currently in the process of discussing physiological examples of where the GS cascade is important. Okay, and the physiological examples that we are looking at are the effect of adrenaline, also called epinephrine, that has been released into the bloodstream on uh, tissues including the skeletal muscle, the hepatocytes of the liver, and the adipocytes. Okay, so so far we've looked at the effects of adrenaline on hepatocytes and skeletal muscle cells, and we've seen that by acting on the beta-2 adrenergic receptor and activating the GS cascade leading to the activation of protein kinase A, uh, adrenaline promotes glycogenolysis in skeletal muscle cells and hepatocytes. Okay? Uh, and uh, this produces lots of glucose 1-phosphate in these two cell types, which is then converted into glucose 6-phosphate by phosphoglucose mutase, and the glucose 6-phosphate then either goes down the glycolysis pathway, in the case of the skeletal muscle cells, to generate ATP, which is needed for muscle contraction, okay? Uh, or, in the case of the hepatocytes, the glucose 6-phosphate is converted back into glucose by glucose 6-phosphatase, an enzyme that's only expressed in the hepatocytes, not the skeletal muscle cells, and then that glucose can be transported into the bloodstream by GLUT2, and then it can go to the skeletal muscle cells to supply them with nutrients. Okay, right. Now what we want to see is the effect of adrenaline on the adipocytes. Okay, now remember what is the whole purpose of this. The adrenaline has been released into the bloodstream because of some sudden stressful occurrence. Okay, so maybe a bear arriving. Okay, and your body is preparing for the fight or flight response. Now, in fight or flight, you're going to have to move a lot. Okay, and therefore your skeletal muscle cells are going to need energy to contract. Okay, and that's what this is all about, trying to upregulate the nutrient supply for the skeletal muscle cells. Now, through its actions on the skeletal muscle cells directly, and the hepatocytes in which it causes this breakdown of the glycogen reserves, uh, it is promoting the amount of glucose that's available for the skeletal muscle cells. We're now going to have a look at the effect of adrenaline on the adipocytes, and in the adipocytes it's going to promote uh, lipolysis, the breakdown of triacylglycerols in the adipocytes, and release of free fatty acids into the bloodstream, and those free fatty acids can go to the skeletal muscle cells and be used to produce energy. Okay, right. Uh, so, Basically, adrenaline is going to promote lipolysis in the adipocytes. So firstly, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, adipocytes to make sure that we've all got a good understanding of what an adipocyte is and what it looks like. Okay, so I'll draw my adipocyte here. Okay, now adipocytes are utterly dominated by a huge structure known as a lipid droplet. Okay, so here is the nucleus of the adipocyte. Okay, and inside the adipocyte, what you'll have is this large structure which is called a lipid droplet. Okay, and for short, lipid droplets are abbreviated as LDs. Okay, so this can be abbreviated down to LD. Okay, now let me tell you about what, what a lipid droplet actually is. So a lipid droplet is a huge, great storage of triacylglycerols mainly. So let me just show you the structure of a triacylglycerol. Okay, so I'll draw a cartoon picture of a triacylglycerol. And basically, a triacylglycerol consists of a glycerol molecule, which is represented by this vertical line coloured in, in green there. Okay, so that represents the glycerol molecule. Okay, and glycerol has a slightly more correct name, the chemist name. Okay, and the chemist name for glycerol is propane 1,2,3-triol. Okay, and although propane 1,2,3-triol is more of a mouthful than glycerol, it's a more useful name than glycerol because it tells us exactly what we're actually dealing with here. It tells us that we're dealing with a free carbon molecule, that's the propane, where we've got alcohol groups coming off the first, the second, and the third carbons of that molecule. Okay, that is propane 1,2,3-triol. Okay, then, to create the triacylglycerol, what you do is attach 
free long chain carboxylic acids or free fatty acids onto uh, each one of those alcohol groups coming off the glycerol molecule. Okay, so these horizontal lines in orange, these represent what are called fatty acids. And those are just really long hydrophobic uh, carboxylic acids. Okay, and the carboxylic acid group is then going to be esterified to the alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. So each one of these fatty acids is esterified onto uh, one of the alcohol groups of the glycerol molecules. And that creates you then what's called a triacyl glycerol molecule. Okay, or for short, you can abbreviate triacyl glycerol down into TAG, T for tri, A for acyl, and then G for glycerol. Okay, right, so this is the main type of fat molecule that is stored within uh, adipocytes. Okay, now, the lipid droplet then is surrounded by a phospholipid monolayer. So this boundary here within the cytoplasm is a phospholipid monolayer. So if I just draw this, you'll have a monolayer of phospholipids. And they'll have their polar heads facing out into the cytoplasm and interacting with the water there. Okay, and their hydrophobic tails will be facing into the centre of the lipid droplet and interacting with the triacyl glycerols in the centre. Okay, contrast that to the main membrane of the cell, the cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, and which has phospholipids um, oppositely oriented to one another, like so. So the where the phosphate groups are pointing into the, either the cytoplasm or out into the extracellular fluid, and the uh, long chain carboxylic acids are directed towards one another, making a hydrophobic core in the middle of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so the membrane of a lipid droplet is just a phospholipid monolayer, not a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, and that makes sense because, after all, it's facing into a really hydrophobic environment, so you don't want to have a phospholipid bilayer there here because then you'd have the polar heads of the inner phospholipids uh, facing into a really hydrophobic environment. So this is a phospholipid monomer. Okay, so that's the structure then of a lipid droplet. And basically most of the adipocyte here, or the fat cell, is dominated by this lipid droplet. Okay, right. So basically, when adrenaline acts on these um, adipocytes, what it's going to promote is a process called lipolysis. Okay, and in lipolysis, the triacylglycerols um, within the lipid droplet are going to be broken down into glycerol and free fatty acids. Okay, so I'll show this. So you can break these ester links between the long chain carboxylic acids and the glycerol molecule, and what you'll create is these fatty acids that are now free, and then a glycerol molecule which is now free. Okay, so these are now called free fatty acid molecules, and for short, uh, the free fatty acids are abbreviated to FFAs. Okay, now FFAs, once they've been produced, will uh, leave the adipocyte, okay, they'll go into the bloodstream, and the way they're transported around the blood is that they're carried by a protein that's in the blood called albumin, a very important protein in the blood. Okay, so free fatty acids that are being released by the adipocytes into the bloodstream will be carried uh, on this protein albumin and then they can be carried to skeletal muscle cells where they can be then used uh, to generate ATP via beta oxidation. Okay, right, so what we now want to see is why does adrenaline promote uh, this breakdown of triacylglycerols into uh, free free fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. Okay, so let's start by considering which receptor do you actually have for adrenaline on the surface of the adipocytes. So basically you have a beta-free adrenergic receptor on the surface of the adipocytes. So this is the beta-free adrenergic receptor on the plasma membrane of the adipocyte. And we've seen that the beta-free adrenergic receptor is GS-coupled, so it will activate GS heterotrimeric G proteins. You'll therefore have active alpha GTP subunits, which will then activate denmal cyclase enzymes in this uh, adipocyte, therefore producing cyclic AMP and activating protein kinase A. So now, what is the protein kinase A catalytic subunit going to phosphorylate in order to actually trigger this breakdown of triacylglycerols? 
Okay, well basically it's going to phosphorylate uh, an enzyme that is within the cytoplasm of the adipocyte called hormone-sensitive lipase. Okay, and for sure, hormone-sensitive lipase is often abbreviated to HSL. So this stands for hormone, that's the H, and then sensitive, that's the S, and it's hormone-sensitive lipase. Now, hormone-sensitive lipase is usually within the cytoplasm of the cell, and it's a little bit difficult to show it there, so I'll draw it down here. Okay, so here is how I'll draw hormone-sensitive lipase. And basically, this is usually floating around in the cytoplasm of the cell, okay? And once it's been phosphorylated by the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A, it now is activated and it's going to relocate, basically. It's going to relocate to the outer side of the lipid droplets, like so. Okay, so here it is now relocated to the outer side of the lipid droplet, okay? And it can now start taking um, triacylglycerols within the lipid droplet here and breaking them down, breaking those ester links, hydrolyzing those ester links and releasing the free fatty acids from the triacylglycerols, okay? And producing the glycerol molecule as well. And then the free fatty acid molecules can leave the adipocyte, they're lipid soluble so they can just diffuse through the membranes, okay? And go into the blood where they can then bind to um, albumin molecules in the blood. Okay, right. Uh, so that then is how uh, the GS uh, cyclic AMP protein kinase A cascade can activate lipolysis within these adipocytes by phosphorylating hormone-sensitive lipase, causing this relocation to the lipid droplets. And then it's going to be active and it's going to be breaking down the triacylglycerols to release free fatty acids and glycerol, which will then be released from the adipocyte. Okay, so that highlights this important point, which is that um, different cells can respond to having the GS cascade activated in very different ways. Okay, right. So that now finishes my discussion of uh, the effects of epinephrine on those uh, free tissues. Okay, what I'm going to now turn my attention to is discussing another target of protein kinase A, because the targets that we've seen in this example are all uh, just protein kinases, okay, or lipases, uh, or other enzymes. They're all enzymes uh, which have uh, been phosphorylated and had their activity changed by that phosphorylation. Okay, so that's been quite a short term change basically because as soon as the uh, cascade is turned off, as soon as the signal is terminated, the protein serine threonine phosphatases will just remove these phosphate groups added by uh, the protein kinase A enzyme. Okay, and therefore it will be turned off and you'll go back to where you were before. Okay, so that's a very short term signal basically. What I now want to discuss is how activation of the G cascade and activation of protein kinase A can actually have a much longer term effect on uh, cells than just uh, what we've seen so far. Okay, and basically this longer term change uh, in cells is going to be dependent on a change in gene expression. Okay, so we want to see how can protein kinase A actually cause changes in gene expression, changes in the epigenetics of the cell, okay, and that can cause much longer changes because once you've produced new proteins, it's more difficult to just get rid of those as soon as the signal is gone, okay, so this can have much longer lasting effects basically on the cell. Okay, so basically what I want to discuss is a target for protein kinase A, which is called Kreb protein. Okay, now, Kreb protein is a protein which is located in the nucleus of cells, okay, and it is a transcription factor. It's going to be able to regulate the expression of genes. Okay, now, before we actually discuss uh, Kreb protein specifically, I just want to make sure everyone is familiar with the concept of a general transcription factor, a specific transcription factor, a transcription regulator. I want to make sure everyone's got a firm picture of how epigenetic control of transcription actually works. Okay, so, 
let me draw two parallel lines, but these parallel lines now are not going to represent a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, this time, this represents a piece of double-stranded DNA rather than a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, right. Uh, so, this portion of the DNA that I've now highlighted in blue here, uh, this is a gene of some sort. So we're just discussing how you control the transcription of genes at the moment in general. Okay, so this is some arbitrary gene here. Okay, now, what controls the transcription of a gene? Okay, well, it's the portion of DNA that is upstream of that gene. Okay, and the portion of DNA upstream of the gene is what's known as the gene control region. Okay, so all of this portion that I've got upstream of this gene is going to represent the gene control region for this gene. Okay, now part of the gene control region is the portion that's instantly upstream of the gene, okay, which is this portion that I'm highlighting in red here. And this is a special portion of the gene control region called the promoter region. Okay, now the promoter region is the portion where transcription factors called general transcription factors bind. And then on top of the general transcription factors, the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme is constructed. Okay, so let me take a step back and discuss transcription factors and what a transcription factor is. Okay, so. A transcription factor is a protein which is capable of binding to a certain sequence of DNA. Okay, so they bind to a specific sequence of DNA, and usually this sequence of DNA is between 4 and 10 base pairs long. Okay, so there are these special DNA binding sequences for the transcription factor. And basically, wherever that sequence of nucleotides is found, the transcription factor will bind to it in the DNA. Okay, so this is called the DNA binding sequence for the transcription factor. Okay, now, there are two different types of transcription factor. Okay, that's the definition of a transcription factor, just a protein which can bind uh, to uh, these special sequences of the DNA, and then it has something to do with controlling transcription. Okay, but now it's important to understand that there are two different types. There are the general transcription factors, of which there are very, very few, okay? Uh, you don't have that many general transcription factors, not compared to the other type of transcription factor, which is called the specific transcription factor, which you have an absolutely hideously large number of, okay? The general transcription factors are very, very special ones. These are the ones which have their special DNA binding sequences in the promoter region uh, of the the gene control region for this gene, okay? And they are the ones which have to bind here so that the RNA polymerase 2 can bind on top of them. Okay, so I'll represent them here. Now, there's quite a lot of them. It's close to 30 how many there are, okay? Um, and they all need to bind to special little DNA binding sequences which are going to be found in the promoter region of absolutely every gene. And this is why they are called the general transcription factors, okay? Every single gene in the human genome will have in its gene control region uh, a promoter region, and this promoter region will contain DNA binding sequences for these general transcription factors. It has to, okay? And the reason it has to is that these general transcription factors, an example of which is transcription factor TF2D, okay, that's a very famous example, which binds to a special sequence called TARTAR, Okay, thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine. Okay, often called the tartar box. Okay, so we'll imagine this is transcription factor 2D, and this is the tartar box here. Okay, so that's just a famous example of a general transcription factor. Okay, so these general transcription factors bind to DNA binding sequences that are found in the promoter region upstream of every single gene in the human genome, and they have to bind there so that the RNA polymerase 2 complex can assemble on top of them, and then the RNA polymerase 2 uh, complex can then work its way along the coding strand of the gene and synthesize a piece of mRNA. Okay, so basically, unless you have your promoter region with the binding sites for these general transcription factors, you can't transcribe your gene whatsoever. 
Okay, so that's what the promoter region is all about. It's about uh, being the site of assembly of this RNA polymerase 2 enzyme complex. The general transcription factors bind first, and then on top of them, the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, which I'm abbreviating down to RNAP2 here, RNA for RNA, P for polymerase, and then 2 for 2. That assembles on top of the general transcription factors. Okay, and it will work its way along the coding strand here, which is the one that's actually used to make a piece of mRNA that's complementary to it and synthesize this piece of mRNA. Okay, right. Uh, so that's the general transcription factors, and that's the promoter region of the gene control region. However, there's a much bigger portion of the gene control region upstream of the promoter region, and there are these things called specific transcription factors. So what's this all about now? And this is the type of transcription factor that CREB is actually going to be. Okay, it's not a general transcription factor. It's not quite that important. Okay, but it is a specific transcription factor. So, basically... This other portion of the gene control region, which I'd better not colour in in blue since that was the colour the gene was in. Okay, this other portion of the gene control region, the portion of the gene control region upstream of the promoter region, this will contain DNA binding sequences for other types of transcription factors, which are called specific transcription factors. Okay, and there is another name for specific transcription factors. These are also called transcription regulators. Okay, now, every different gene in the eukaryotic genome will have different DNA binding sequences for specific transcription factors uh, in its portion of the gene control region upstream of the promoter region. Okay, so every gene in the human genome had the same uh, DNA binding sequences in this promoter region so that every gene could get the general transcription factors binding there so that it could assemble the RNA polymerase 2 on top of those. Okay, but in this other region now, every gene differs basically, which means that different specific transcription factors combined upstream of different genes basically. Okay, and specific transcription factors are not necessary to bind in order for transcription to occur, so they're not as important as the general transcription factors. Okay. In fact, specific transcription factors generally, they will bind upstream of a few genes, generally around 100, but they won't bind upstream of all genes. So not all genes will contain a DNA binding sequence for a certain specific transcription factor. It will be a collection of usually around 100 genes that contain that DNA binding sequence for uh, a specific, specific transcription factor. Okay, now, what then happens when a specific transcription factor binds to its DNA binding sequence in this region of the gene control region upstream of the promoter region? Well, basically, it influences the probability that the gene is going to be transcribed. Okay, so here's our specific transcription factor now in vivid purple here. Okay, so it has the ability to influence the probability that RNA polymerase 2 and the general transcription factors are actually going to assemble on this promoter region here. Okay, and specific transcription factors, or transcription regulators as they're also called, can be of two flavours. They can either be activators, transcription activators, or they can be transcription repressors. Okay. Now, you can probably guess what this means, but I'll spell it out anyway. Okay. The transcription regulators, which are activators, are going to bind to some DNA binding sequence in this portion of the gene control region upstream of the promoter region, and they are going to promote the probability that RNA polymerase 2 will assemble on the promoter region. They're going to make it more likely that RNA polymerase 2 will assemble here, and therefore, RNA polymerase 2 will bind there more often, and you will get more transcription of the downstream gene. So they're going to promote the expression of the downstream gene. In contrast, transcriptional repressors, they are going to bind to their DNA binding sequence up in this portion of the gene control region, upstream of the promoter region, and they're going to decrease the probability that the RNA polymerase 2 complex is going to assemble on top of the promoter region, and therefore they're going to decrease the probability that the downstream gene is going to be um, transcribed, basically, and therefore they're going to decrease the amount of mRNA that's actually produced for that gene. 
Okay, now how do these work? How do the specific transcription factors do this? Okay, well there are two ways mainly. Okay, either they can do it quite directly, and what I mean by that is they can directly interact with the assembling RNA polymerase 2 complex. So remember, the DNA can fold back around. You can imagine having this folded back around here. So this specific transcription factor could actually be very close to the RNA polymerase 2 that's assembling on the top of this promoter region. Okay, And therefore, it could have a direct interaction with the RNA polymerase 2 assembling there and can either increase the probability of it assembling there or decrease the probability that it assembles there. Okay, so that's a sort of direct way in which they can change the probability of the downstream gene being transcribed. Then there's a more indirect way. Okay, and the more indirect way uh, involves changing the chromatin structure, so chromatin remodeling. So let me just make sure everyone's familiar with the concept of chromatin. Okay, so basically, in the nucleus of cells, DNA is not just free, okay? Instead, it is in this structure called chromatin. And what chromatin consists of is the DNA wrapped around histone complexes, okay? So I'll show this like so. So here is a histone complex, which I'm just going to represent as this uh, turquoise square here. And basically, what you have is the DNA strand, which I'll show here, wraps around the histone complex twice, like so. And then it can go off and wrap around another histone complex, which I'll have down here. So here is a second histone complex, which I'll colour in turquoise as well. And then the DNA can wrap around this one twice, so once and then twice. And then if we can imagine there's another histone complex there, it'll wrap around that one. And then you can see that there's a recurring pattern here, okay? And this structure that we're creating, which is often compared to beads on a string here, okay, where the DNA wrapped around the histone complexes is analogous to the beads, and the uh, linker pieces of DNA between uh, each of those is analogous to the string. This is what is meant by chromatin, okay? So, basically, how does chromatin affect transcription of genes, well, basically, if the DNA is wrapped around histone complexes very tightly, then it's very difficult for the general transcription factors and the RNA polymerase 2 to assemble on top of the promoter region in that DNA, okay? Because most of the length of the DNA is wrapped around histone complexes. Understand that that's a crucial part of the understanding here. Very little of the DNA is in these linker regions. Most of it is wrapped around histone complexes, okay? So it's likely that our promoter region is wrapped around some histone complex, basically. And if the DNA is wrapped too tightly around the histone complex, then the RNA polymerase 2 cannot assemble on top of it, okay, and therefore that hugely suppresses the transcription of the downstream gene. Okay? In contrast, if the DNA is nice and loosely wrapped around the histone complex, uh, then you're going to get more um, transcription of the downstream gene because the general transcription factors and the RNA polymerase 2 are more likely to actually assemble on top of that promoter region. Okay, right. So one way that um, transcription regulators can change the probability of the downstream gene being transcribed is by changing the structure of the chromatin so that you open the chromatin out more, okay, so that it becomes loosely wrapped around the histone complex rather than very tightly wrapped around the histone complex. Okay, so how can you do this? Well, basically, what can happen is the uh, transcription regulator, which is bound to the DNA binding sequence here in the uh, gene control region, can then bind on top of this another protein, okay, which can either be a histone acetyl transferase or a histone methyl transferase. Okay, so let me just spell these out. So histone acetyl transferase enzymes, okay, are going to put acetyl groups on the histones of the histone complexes, okay? And when you put acetyl groups on the histone proteins of the histone complexes, that causes the DNA that's wrapped around these histone complexes uh, to become more loosely wound around those histone complexes, okay? 
So acetylation of histone proteins opens up the DNA basically, and these enzymes are known as HATs for short. Okay, so if you want your transcription regulator to be an activator to increase the probability of the downstream gene being transcribed, then you could have it binding in the gene control region, recruiting a histone acetyltransferase. Okay, this histone acetyltransferase could acetylate lots of the local histones, okay, causing the DNA to wrap more loosely around the histone complex and therefore increasing the probability that the RNA polymerase 2 will assemble on top of your promoter region. Okay. In contrast, if you want your transcription regulator to be a repressor, then instead of recruiting a histone acetyltransferase to your transcription regulator, what you would want to recruit is an enzyme called a histone methyl transferase, okay. uh, which for short is called an HMT. Okay. And these enzymes uh, methylate the proteins of uh, histone complexes. And through methylating the proteins of histone complexes, that causes the DNA to wrap more tightly around the histone complexes and therefore decreases the transcription of uh, genes in that portion of DNA because now the RNA polymerase 2 is less likely to assemble on uh, the promoter region of the gene. So to spell this out, if you wanted your transcription regulator to be a repressor, it could uh, recruit a histone methyl transferase here. Okay, this could methylate the local histone histones, causing the DNA to wrap more tightly around the histone complex, okay, and therefore making it less likely that RNA polymerase 2 is going to be able to assemble in your promoter region, and therefore making it less likely that the downstream gene is going to be transcribed. Okay, so those are two more indirect ways by which um, transcription regulators can change the probability that the downstream gene is going to actually be uh, transcribed, basically. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll continue this discussion and look specifically at what the CREV protein is and uh, what it's going to do.